Bob Soroka. This is Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana. And today's topic is going to be on uh, growing tomatoes. Now this is really an introductory class because there's so many new tomatoes, it's hard to keep up with the latest. There's, there's so many. So anyway, uh, first off, the tomato plants are a new world crop. They were discovered by ancient civilizations in, uh, or ancient peoples in valleys in the Andes, Western Andes. Um, they say be probably Ecuador, most likely place of origin. They were just small little things discovered by the, of course, the um, Spanish uh, explorers taken back to the Mediterranean and from there they were brought to the United States and North America. So, of course, a long time ago they were thought to be poisonous. They may not be totally safe to eat, but they're certainly good to eat. So, now there's different kinds of tomatoes. Let's see. The um, determinants, I'll put it right down. So you have determinants. indeterminate. By far the most popular is indeterminate and there's very few determinate tomatoes still sold retail. Now commercially most of the big farms out in the field use the determinate. So the difference between uh, determinate tomatoes <coughs> grow a bit like pepper plants do. They, they branch evenly then they bloom all this, all the branches tend to bloom at the same time and make a crop at the same time on all their branches and you can pretty much harvest all at once. So the processed tomatoes, especially ketchup and paste tomatoes, are usually determinate ones so that they can go through the field once with the machine and machine harvest them and they're done. Now this determinate plant will make another crop, but they don't usually wait for that second crop. The indeterminate <coughs> are the tomatoes that will grow branches that, they, and they can branch out, but what they do is they will, um, each branch as it grows will make flowers and fruit, and the fruit ripens as the branch gets older. So you always have a few fruit ripening, and starting in a couple months, you have a few fruit, fruit ripening at all times as the plant grows, so that's an indeterminate and determinate, but I would say 95% of all the plants out there, I think we might have celebrity, I think it's a determinate, but most of them are indeterminates, so that you'll get a crop and it just keeps growing. The other thing to know is the difference between heirloom and hybrid, there, there's not much. years ago, a gentleman was walking his son through the tomatoes and said, here, here's some hybrid tomatoes. And he, the kid looks at him and says, that doesn't look like a car. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's what type technology is. So the only difference between heirlooms and hybrids, heirlooms, it, it has to do with their chromosomes. So an heirloom tomato generally has, if it's a diploid, most tomatoes I know are diploids, there might be some tetraploids out there, but uh, heirlooms have two sets of the same chromosomes in general. And hybrids, the, the two parents were widely different, so their genetics are different. I mean, you can't say one's natural, one's not, because all tomatoes pretty much are, uh, you know, they're, they're made by man, um, you know, except for the wild, little tiny wild ones in, in down in South America. But the, air, the hybrid is a daughter or son of two heirlooms. So the heirloom tomatoes, the hybrid tomatoes we have, the seed company has to maintain its two heirloom parents. Sometimes they'll just keep one plant going forever because you can take cuttings of tomatoes and they do root. You can keep the plant going forever almost. And they'll 
just keep crossing those two heirloom uh, tomatoes. You know, they they know which one they got the female <coughs> flower from and which one they got the male pollen from. They keep crossing it, the same ones over and over. And there are, the seeds they got on those fruit, which have the genetics of both parents, will be the hybrids. So in order to make a hybrid, you have to have two heirlooms. Now, there are, quote, original heirlooms, which, you know, it makes more sense. Those were things handed down generation to generation. But there are man-made heirlooms now, you know, they, they have, you know, there's, there's really no difference between uh, heirlooms from a long time ago and modern heirlooms, except that we can make an, a hybrid into an heirloom in only about seven generations, but it may not be exactly the same. So they, you know, if you create a new tomato, uh, it's uh, it, the seeds out of that fruit will be similar, you know, might be the same as the one you created, but some of them will be the parents that created it. So what they do to make an heirloom out of a hybrid is they'll take the seeds out of the hybrid, plant them all, throw away the ones that look like the parents and save the one that looks like the hybrid. If you do that for seven generations, you've pretty much taken, made all the chromosomes about the same again. So they, and then they call it an heirloom. They'll take a hybrid and call it an heirloom. The main reason they do that is to make the seeds cheaper. Because you take, you have maintained two heirlooms, and you have to you know, carefully <coughs> manipulate the flowers to get the pollen out of this one, and don't get the pollen out of that one, and cross them, and then take the seeds out. Hybrid seeds are real expensive. Heirloom seeds, and once you get that line down pretty clean, so that it all resembles itself, um, <laughs> you just take the seeds out of the fruit. The seeds are a lot cheaper, so. And we have some packages of, of tomato seeds and a, and a regular heirloom, uh, 30 seeds for two bucks. And, they, and they're, you can make them cheaper than that if you buy a lot of them. But here's a hybrid, 15 seeds for three and a half dollars. Or this one's six dollars, 10 seeds. Sometimes with the heirlooms you get more extreme differences, but the hybrids, I don't know, we tend, you know, hybrids have more chromosomes or different chromosomes in them, so they can be more different than the heirlooms too, so it's, it's real hard to say. There are some tomatoes we prefer the hybrid version for taste. Question for you: A lot of times when I plant, I'll plant like say better boy earlier or whatever. My the seeds that fall, they always come out of the cherry tomatoes. Why is that? <laughs> well, I never uh, plant both, cherry tomatoes. Both early also. girl and better, better boy. boy are hybrids. Okay. So you don't know what their parents would. The parents apparently their parents had some cherry in them. <clears throat> so I've never gotten true to whatever this. Okay. So in other words, we can't sell the to say the seeds of celebrity or whatever. Well, you and could, but you don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. That's the okay. Thing. Yeah. There, uh, you know, if it's true genetics, half will be the similar, <clears throat> but half will be either parent. Okay. So depends on how the genetics actually work in tomatoes. I know uh, some fruits and vegetables are have way more genetics than just two chromosomes. Okay. <laughs> So that's, that's one of the reasons why you can buy a lot of the heirlooms in six packs, but the hybrids often come in, in single pots and a lot of them are real expensive on top of that. This is like a $5 tomato because its seeds cost this grower probably 30, 40 cents even when they buy them in volume and it still costs a lot. So that's one of the reasons of that expensive price, yes. Does the hardiness of the plant go by what kind of seed they are, or just the variety of plants? Well, you know, the problem with, with seed-grown plants, you know, seed-grown plants are always called a variety because every seed is different, just like us. So, 
so there, you know, there's a lot of room for error. I mean, we, we, st we, we have grown a lot of tomatoes from seed, and we'll plant about a lot of a flat of maybe 40, 50 seeds. About uh, three or four plants just don't look right. We just don't even sell them. So there are, you know, it's just like your kids. Uh, most of them will be fine. They'll they'll be kind of like you. Now we're doing that one that's really weird. So that's genetics for you. Just like us. But you can't grow them out. So you know, all some these, even if they're the, even if they're hybrids, even if they're heirlooms, they're all different. They're all a little different. Now, just so you know, we don't know of any GMO tomatoes, you know, laboratory-created tomatoes that are on the market at this time. There were, there was one back in the 90s. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it was uh, genetically modified not to over-ripen on the store shelf. Uh, and it didn't taste very good, so it was discontinued. But it, it, it was created for the commercial industry so that the tomatoes would last longer. I mean, tomatoes last long enough. So one of the warnings that the egg department has sent to farmers throughout California is that there are some really bad diseases out there. Um, the worst one, the latest one, is fusarium, a new version of fusarium, which is a root rot disease, and the spores are airborne. And two years ago, you know, they they wrote us letters or emailed us letters, you know, right? Um, saying that 100% of California farms are infected by this new fungus. And some farms, you know, 40% involved or, you know, they, but they found it on every farm. They said it's just all over. So they told the farmers, you know, when you grow your tomato crops, don't grow them for very long. You get your crop out of them and then turn them in there because they're catching that disease. I mean, they're, you know, the longer they're out there, the more they have a chance they have of catching this fusarium. Now, fusarium, generally what it, the symptoms it causes is one stem will just turn yellow and die, another stem turns yellow and die. But there's a lot of diseases that do that too. But if you see, you know, they said, especially if you see half the leaf turn yellow, it's, there's something in there blocking the upflow of sap. And that's what fusarium, one of the first signs of it is half the leaf turns yellow and then half, and then whole branches start dying off. Um, they said so. They said keep your crop short, uh, plant new ones if you want a longer crop. Just don't have a plant around too long because it probably caught the disease and it's going downhill. And there's really no cure for this, so that's what they're telling farmers: just grow your crops fast, harvest quickly, uh, and then throw them out. There's another disease that's spread by a bug: potato psyllid. Uh, the potato cell doesn't do much damage, just like a big aphid, but it can transfer a disease called Solanobacter something something that will also stop the flow of sap through the branch. You get dead branches from that one too. So now fusarium will actually make the inside this uh, the base of the stem turn gray and slimy. The Solanobacter will just cut off the circulation right at the point of entry. So. A little bit differences between the two, but just as devastating. They said uh, uh, about eight years ago, 80% of the Baja crop was lost to that disease. 40% of the San Diego County crop was lost to that disease. They they can treat it, but not organically. So what they said they would have to do for those is put a systemic in the field before they even plant the crop. And that bug takes one bite out of the tomato plant, it's killed. I don't think we want to do that with our tomato plants, but it's systemic poison. In theory, systemics don't get in the fruit, but that's the theory. Because uh, systemics are brought up to the water flowing tissue, the xylem. So the water 
uptake brings the systemic to the foliage, the fruit is connected to the backflow, which is not really directly connected to the upflow, and it's, and it's connected to the backflow going down to the root. So they claim the systemics don't get into fruit. They'll get into vegetables, but not fruit. So you don't want to put a systemic in your vegetable garden because you have to rotate crops and you'll be, you know, you don't want the systemic anywhere near your uh, vegetables, your edible leafy vegetables, put it that way. So that one is pretty nasty too. We've seen that. Yes. Does it stay in the soil? So when you replant or rotate your crops, it affects the... The disease? Or? The disease, no. Now most diseases, just like our diseases, they can't uh, handle anything. You know, they need the loving tissue, the live body, to, to be successful. Once the plant dies, it, they're not successful. They just and the only so the only way that one is spread is by that potato siller. But you know, even though you can spray your plants a lot with with non you know. The organic products, it's just hard because most of the organic products don't last, don't persist long enough uh, on the plant to prevent. And in fact, most, even the persistent organics, the bug can still sit there and take one bite and, and then it's history. The disease is, is uh, transferred. So it's hard to deal with these new diseases. You just, you know, you see it go on, you just plant, <laughs> replant. Okay. So basically you just plant and then, and then when you see it's a disease and you just look at it. Right. That's about all we can do. Now the, on most tomatoes, the ideal temperature for making fruit, this is for flowering and fruiting, is between 55 degrees Fahrenheit and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's when the flowers develop properly. So we're in that, we're just, you know, we're there. I mean, we're there. Uh, depends on how, you know, the nights go, but generally um, the tomato's closer to the ground, the ground stays warmer than the air, so uh, you'll be, you'll probably stay at 55 or above from now. And we should, like last year, we didn't hit 85 till August. So you can have a good long season. If we had 85 in June, which sometimes we do, or even in May, then there goes your production. It just goes downhill. Uh, of course, it takes about two months after the flowers make start making the fruit for the fruit to ripen in the summer, longer in the fall. So, so that's the temperatures. Now, there are some that can go earlier than that lower temperatures, some that can go higher temperatures. Early girl can probably start out a few degrees cooler and then Cherokee purple can go a little bit hotter. Um, but basically, you know, we have a nice window to get fruit here in the spring. Now growing tomatoes, uh, certainly in the ground is fine. Um, Again, we need to rotate crops if you grow them in the ground. You can grow, now we have some customers, you know, all they want to do is grow tomatoes. And it's real hard to rotate if that's all you're doing. Now, in our yards back you know, 30 years ago, what I did is I wanted to see what would happen if you do grow the tomatoes in the same spot over and over. So the first year, of course, wonderful. Second year, I would say about 80% is good. Third year, they wouldn't even ripen a single fruit. And then you couldn't grow them in there at all for the next year. So what happens with any plant is every time you grow a crop, you leave behind, you know, you just can't remove all the roots. I mean, they make thousands and thousands of little roots and you pull the plant out, you've left most of those roots in the ground and they're dead and dying and rotting. And apparently it takes them more than a year for them to totally disappear. Now there's one way around that. So there's a type of gardening called square foot gardening, <coughs> where they put everything, mix everything up. And they've learned over the years, you gotta make that soil really light and loose. 
in order to make that successful. So they put a lot of vermiculite, perlite, peat moss, <coughs> so that when you pull your plants out, the roots come with them. Because if you leave those roots there and they're dying and dead, there's no way that square foot gardening method could work. But they've learned, I, you know, I think by trial and error that, yeah, in order to have those roots uh, removed, you've got to make the soil really lightweight. Uh, when the ground we rotate crops, we like to see at least three years between crops. Uh, a friend of mine who's a professional, uh, actual farmer, they said they're on a 10 crop rotation cycle, which takes them about four years to do, depends on how long you leave the crops. <coughs> In other words, you grow uh, 10 unrelated plants before you grow your tomatoes again. So, you know, tomatoes are in the same family as peppers, eggplant, and potatoes, and tomatillos. So that family you can put, so if you have, say, at least three beds. So you plant all your tomatoes, peppers, eggplants in one bed, and then the next year you plant them all in the next bed, and then the next year you now, you know, if you mix plants up, you get fewer pests, but you just can't, it's just hard to rotate. So you get fewer, you know, if you have a tomato next to corn, next to beans, next to squash, you get fewer pests in there that, that year. But then your rotation is all messed up, and you can't do, you know, all you can do is throw away the dirt and put new dirt in there. I mean, that's an option. Or do what is called double digging. <laughs> that, that's done in areas where the soil is really soft. So double digging, what that is, in England they can do this, that peaty soil, but what you do is most plant roots are in the top foot of the soil. So double digging is when you take that top foot of soil and put it over here, you dig down, take the next foot of soil, put it over here, and then reverse them going in so that all your roots are now down there and the soil up here is pretty clean. That's a lot. I had one customer try that. He says, it works, but boy, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> now, Gary, would it be beneficial at this time, okay, so I do raised beds, just to get a bale of, like, pumice or whatever and peat moss and just throw it in to mix in at this time to make it easier for the roots to come out in the fall? I don't know. It may not be good enough. I mean, you know, square foot garden, when they make that so light, it's really light. Vermiculite, perlite, peat moss. I don't know that they put much else in there. Uh, oh, they don't put any garden, like garden soil, per se, like with my mulch, like my. Oh, well, okay. So, uh, as far as tomatoes go, like most plants do not like to grow in compost. Okay. They'd rather grow in normal soil, which is sand, silt, and clay. There's no organic. Yeah, there's really no organic matter in the ground. Uh, of any significance, it's, well, it is significant at 1%. So they said the average farm in California, the soil is 1% organic, which is by volume. Uh, and they said that's, per and the people who know say that's perfect. You don't want much organic matter in the ground because it causes root rot. <clears throat> in nature, the organic matter belongs on top of the ground. Now, tomatoes is one plant that's really tolerant to compost being in the ground. So you can get a what is called a garden soil bought at a big box store, which is really just ground up dead trees, and you can grow a tomato in it decently. It won't be as good as if you did it in pure sand or pure perlite, uh, any of those things that they actually use from hothouse growers. Uh, you know, the hothouse people, it's so expensive to grow plants in a hothouse, they know what works the best. So they're using stuff like perlite, sand, um, clay pellets, um, peat, they'll even use peat moss sometimes, but uh, they won't use ground up dead trees like we've been told to do here. So uh, anyway, that's a different, that lecture was the last two weeks. So anyway, tomatoes can get by with getting cheap soil and throwing it away after every crop and getting new stuff that, you know, um, but if you want to save money over a long time, you know, just rotate your crops uh, and keep them rotated and then you shouldn't have much trouble.
Fertilizer wise, they need something, but tomatoes aren't a heavy feeder. So almost any of the uh, fertilizers work fine. If you want to use the general purpose fruit tree, that'll work. Did you use that one for the tomatoes? Yes. The fruit trees for tomatoes? Yeah, I mean, the fruit tree fertilizer pretty much follows U.S. Department of Agriculture's suggestions to farmers for an average crop fertilizer is 624. It's what they told the farmers that it would be proper to use on any crop. So tomatoes like a lot of nitrogen up front, and then later on they want the phosphorus and potassium. Uh, the phosphorus we don't need to add to our garden soil because our soil is, they say, claim it has twice as much phosphorus as most plants need. So that's one nutrient that you don't have to add. Our soil's got plenty of phosphorus. Potassium we need to add. Nitrogen we always need to add. It's always going away. So watch your leaves. If your leaves stay fairly green like this. Now, a friend of mine used, used to grow tomatoes starts for the farms. And he, and he showed me what they looked like, what the farmers wanted. They weren't green like this. They were really yellow, real pale. And he says that what they do is they would keep the fans on and keep them, it toughens them up. Not much fertilizer, wind on them, because on the farms they're machine planted. They have to take these things, the machine just put them in the ground. So he says they can't be soft like this, like they sell to uh, retail. They gotta be <coughs> real tough. <laughs> Real tough guys to go into those farms, and then they feed them good, and then they get going. So, would you uh, mix the fruit tree fertilizer? Just spread it around your raised bed, or should you do it individually to each plant, like the fertilizer? I would personally, I would just throw it near the stem of the plant, and just kind of spread it around. Yeah, it works good on top. Take it there. in a little bit, water it, and then plant. I plant it first and throw it right next to the stem. Oh, okay. So don't mix it in. Don't have to. Okay. I mean, it'll mix itself in when you water. Okay. And if you do your bed correctly, it's nice to mulch over the top with organic matter. Okay. And that'll keep it moist and, and it'll work. <coughs> so. Is there something you can, when you do, like I have a raised bed, and I try to make them taller, are there other vegetables you can do on top of that instead of mulching? Well, tomatoes actually, so the question was, uh, can you grow another crop to act as a ground cover? Tomatoes act, actually mostly are their own ground cover. But the role of the mulch is to keep the weeds out and to provide some nutrition to keep the soil cool. You might want to add something. You know, dead leaves are nature's mulch. If you have hedges in your yard, just <laughs> throw them in there. Um, Again, you know, if you start planting other plants, you got to watch the rotation. But if it's a plant that's not really anything you grow normally, certainly, you know, like uh, nasturtiums or something like that, you can certainly grow those. And they're sweet less some Achelia, they'll attract pollinators, things like that. Question about tomatoes. So when I was doing this, there was a lot of leaves on the ground. Well, nature knows what to do with dead leaves, so you don't have to worry about treating them or doing anything with them. You just put them there. Uh, there's a fungus in nature that most vegetables use that goes up. So if you have, if this is natural soil, it's been in your yard for a while, there's a fungus in it. You put dead leaves on there, it just goes right up into them and starts breaking them down. They said uh, uh, they've documented that the nutrients from the dead leaf can get back into the, the plant within 90 days, pretty fast. So, so, you know, ideally when you do your garden, you don't disturb the soil. So they're telling farmers, you know, the new, new generation farmers being taught a totally different way to farm. Do not disturb the soil. Most crops do not like disturbed soil. They'd rather have it just sitting. Now the uh, exception to that is brass, the brassacea, the cabbage family, they like disturbed soil. They don't like the mycorrhizal fungus to be out there. 
But most other crops, they want that mycorrhizal fungus to be there. Mycorrhizal fungus hates being turned over and over and over. Uh, it doesn't do well. It's not real happy with that. It's got to reestablish itself. So if you just leave your soil alone, leave the compost on top. Whenever you want to plant a new crop, just pull it aside, put the plant in, put it back. Don't do any work with the soil. Now, the one reason to till your garden is because one reason to till a garden is if you have trees in your yard. Now, farms don't have trees in their yard, and tree roots can really mess up a vegetable garden. Root competition for trees is horrendous. So if you've got trees around, a lot of times you've got to till this to, just to kill those tree roots for a while, get them out of your bed. Otherwise, you can you know, trench around the outside and just cut those roots. Again, roots don't go much below a foot. So if you just slice into the ground around your bed, you'll cut off the tree roots that are coming from your nearby trees. And it can be a tree 50 foot away, 100 foot away. Trees in 20 years will make 100 foot of roots. So they can make it to your bed. Yes. You mentioned compost. So compost not in the yeah, soil, is it because you're talking about the compost on top and then move it aside and move it back? Right. So dead stuff on top of the ground, you can call it compost. And the proper term is duff, dead stuff. Um, because uh, nature, they said, most of the recycled nutrients aren't done by bacteria like in a compost pile, they're done by the fungus, which is not found in a compost pile. So, well, less likely to be found in a compost pile. So my compost pile was put on top of the, you know, on top of the existing dirt, and then the mulch on top of that, or is that actually like a mulch? Oh, it's all, all consider, just considered a mulch. Okay. Your compost is just a mulch. Yes. You say rotating crops. What are there like certain crops? Like, can you rotate between tomatoes and peppers, or are they too close? And you they can are the same family. So, did you get uh, so tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, potatoes, tomatillos, all close to that. Yes. Uh, I heard weeds, and then I have a bougainvillea tree. So that, can I grow some bougainvillea leaves? You know? Yeah. Sure. The what? Plants, yeah, I mean, leaves is nature's fertilizer. So, yeah, that's what is intended by nature to, to provide nutrients for plants. They're just dead leaves. So, yes. If you have a garden bang up against a cement wall and your neighbor has a nice big edge with his roots coming underneath? If the wall is, is brick, block, uh, the putting on that wall may be deep enough to prevent it, because uh, it goes down about a foot, which is maybe deep enough, but if they're old hedges, you assume they're on your side. Yeah. So you would just cut yeah, down? Yeah, just, just cut down. I mean, you can just water and compensate for their hedge, but you know, uh, that's, <laughs> that it could be pretty bad. I mean, you know, some trees, especially Big trees will use 100 gallons on a hot summer day, and it's hard to compensate. You know, at my last house, we had a green belt next to us, and 80 foot pine trees. Like, I don't want to water those pine trees. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're just, I couldn't grow anything on that side of my yard because otherwise, I'd be using hordes of water to keep those plants alive. So. Okay. Um, now in containers, tomatoes can certainly be grown in pots. I had a good friend who used to grow 400 tomato plants in pots every year. Oh, wow. um, he would do tomato taste tests. He would travel around the south and do tomato test tests. So he would grow them all in 15 gallon buckets, which is a little bit larger than you actually need, but it's close. Oh, really? And he would put, uh, one eight foot stake in each one. Oops. And grow his tomato up the stake. And he did this way because he learned his trade actually on in hothouse growing. So in hot houses, you know, they wouldn't use the 15 gallon, of course, they'd have other types of containers, but they would just do it up once, just use one stem. And once I learned exactly why they do that, it makes sense. So, you know, your option, well, of course, in the ground, too, we have these tomato cages where you just let the plant branch freely and then you send the branches through the mm -hmm. cage and all that. Um, 
the ones that will last more than one year are really expensive, and the ones that won't last more than one year are still expensive nowadays. Uh, but most of these, uh, the little welds just break off with the weight of the plants. I mean, those get super heavy. Whereas this should last you probably half a dozen years to a dozen, maybe a dozen years if the paint stays on them. And that's a foldable one, which is pretty nice. And of course, you can grow beans and other things on that too, cucumbers. Um, but the, there's a lot of our customers who believe in going up the single stem, and they have good reason for telling you that. So the reason why they do it, so what they do is they grow their plants 24 inches apart. <coughs> stem to stem, 24 inches. Uh, some go a little closer than that, some are 18 inches. But they'll plant a whole bunch of tomato plants, only allowing one stem, no side branching. Now, some of the side branching, what looks like side branching is your actually your flower stalk, so you have to be careful, let them grow a little bit to determine what's actually coming out, the joints of your stems, if it's, it's actually a side branch or a flowering branch, it's sometimes hard to say. But they only want one stem because at this distance, the foliage is, is about 18 inches across, and there's no room to grow another branch between these two plants. So they said at that distance, they're getting maximum production on that one stem. If you let that thing start branching out, all the side branches are less productive than, uh, well, they all make it less productive. So you can either have one incredibly productive stem, or you can have a whole bunch of half productive stems what they're telling me. So it does make sense. You spend more money up front planting more tomatoes, but each one will get the maximum production of that stem. And in a hothouse, they, they want to plant them, space them exactly the way they want to. So that, and they only let one stem grow. Now in hothouses, of course, it's totally different. They control the environment year round. There's, you know, very few bugs in there, very few diseases, and so they keep that plant going. So it's real interesting how they do it, and you can adapt some of this to your own uh, thing. But most of the modern way of growing tomatoes, up here on the rafters, they've got a spool of twine that they hang down. And they, as the tomato plant grows, it's clipped to this twine. And so there's, of course, leaves, And then they have flowers. And then the tomatoes are forming further down on the stem. So there's about four to six feet of production area that keeps on growing higher and higher. So what they do after, a few leaves after the tomatoes are harvested down here, they will strip off the leaves, lower the whole thing down, and coil the stem on the ground. How do you do that with a stem? Isn't it hard to do? Yeah, it's kind of brittle. Yeah, it's a big circle. It's not a small circle. It's no, but if I'm looking at that tomato plant right there, that, that mm -hmm. we're talking about, the middle part? Well, there, there are special hothouse tomatoes. Uh, oh, okay. okay. And plus, being inside, no wind, all that, the plants are probably more pliable. But the, you know, the, the winding of the stem on the ground is about a four foot circle. They strip off all the leaves so there's no disease associated with it. Just wind the stem on the ground, keep lowering this. They can have the same plant going for three or four years. That's one of the methods that they use. Yes. I don't understand that. Why are the stem on the ground? What part is the stem of and, and how is it? Yeah. So this this plant keeps on growing. Okay, yes. And as it grows, uh -huh. there are, the tomatoes are ripening uh -huh. consecutively and going up the stem. Mm -hmm. And they pull off the leaves on the stem as it as it continues growing and then they lower this old part of the stem on the ground. Yeah. Okay. 
Now the other method that they've used, which is real interesting too, is they'll grow <laughs> tomatoes in a gutter, this uh, gutter filled with water, tomato plants can grow hydroponically, and the plants just sticking out of this and hanging down. And as it grows, after a while, what they do is, you know, this, they stuff more of the stem into the gutter and it roots out. They cut off the very old end of that stem where the roots are. And then they just keep on putting this same plant into the gutter and rooting it that way. Now tomato plants are pretty, are actually easier to propagate from cuttings than they are from seeds. So if you've ever started tomato seeds, uh, what we found is that like 70 degrees, you get maybe one out of 10 seeds sprouting. At 95 degrees, they all sprout. They need it hot. They really, the seeds themselves like it really hot. They, all, they sprout with, with heat. Um, How do you get it from a cutting? You just cut it and stick it in water? Yeah. And it'll root? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, one of my former employees, um, one day he just took, uh, Hundred little pieces. He was pruning a early growth tomato plant, just kind of pieces off, stuck them all in a big pot of dirt, and they all grew. I was amazed. I go, ah, huh? that's pretty amazing. Yeah, well, in our potting soil. Right. Uh, Jerry, can you explain to me? You were talking about some of these, uh, some stems are feeding, and some are the main, and you should not cut off the the one that has the side branches. How do you know the difference between the feeding branch and the side? Branch? Just by the, well, most fruiting branches will start making flower buds within a few inches. Okay. If it doesn't, then it's a uh, new, it's just growing a side branch. So, okay, because we want to eat the compact, which just pull out all the side branches. That's right. So yeah, this, once I learned why they did this, I said, oh, that makes sense. Um, yeah. So you can plant more tomatoes closer, and yeah. but don't let them spread out. Okay, um, now when we grow tomatoes, we usually use our acid mixed potting soil, <clears throat> which is peat moss and pumice rock. It's somewhat acidic, it's around six, five and a half to six, and the tomatoes are fine with that. Um, you can use sand, you can use, again, the cheap soils that other companies make. A friend of mine, uh, uh, grew tomatoes in a bag of chicken manure once. So we know they're really tolerant of, and you know, tomatoes often grow in compost piles, mm -hmm. which no other plant can, which means that their roots don't need that much oxygen comparatively, or they are, you know, or at least they, or perhaps they grow surface, a lot of surface roots so they can get their oxygen. So tomatoes are very tolerant of bad conditions, yes. So I made the mistake of, you know, first time gardener buying miracle Grow everything potting type. Okay, so I got root rot on a lot of my plants and ended up, how do I, but they're, it's expensive to buy soil. So can I just take some of your soil and mix it in with old stuff and it'll be fine? Or, or can I, or because of the rotation stuff, do I have to like not use that at all? Because right now I have it all sitting in buckets and it's just drying out because I, it was, so, so this is the miracle stuff? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I, mean, I don't want to like throw it out, but at the same time, it's not going to do the same thing if I try to use it. Right. You, you shouldn't use it as soil, <clears throat> but you can probably use it as a top dressing. Okay. I mean, if you throw it on your lawn, your lawn will be yeah. real happy with it. Yeah. The grass loves to have a layer of compost on it. So. But Gary, your acid mix, is that like 50-50? 50-50. But, you know, we've grown beautiful tomato plants in pure sand, uh, pure pumice. Pumice, you have to water twice a day, unfortunately. That's why I like uh, when I bought the house. There's a lot of ways, you know, a lot of different ways you can make your soil cheaper than our soil, but it's hard to make it light. So the, the secret of our soil is just a, a light soil that actually works as well as sand does. Because sand was the original potting soil. How about the watering tomato plant? Should you deep water it, or would it be best if you just? Well, you know, in hot houses, it's hydroponic, so it's always wet. Sometimes they're always watered. So they like water. Um, most production plants, you know, tomato plants, 
have a stronger pull on, pull on moisture in the ground than most plants do so they can handle drought better. But if you let them go too dry between watering, you run the risk of, of cracks. So the fruit, you know, those concentric cracks that had formed the fruit, that means they went wet, dry, wet, dry. The fruit's going like this, and it cracks. So that's from being, you know, so it's all farms nowadays, modern farms water daily because all the research has shown that light frequent irrigation has no disadvantages whatsoever. You know, the water district tells you otherwise. Uh, deep and frequent watering does not create deeper roots, does not create healthier roots. Uh, it's not responsible for that at all. Uh, just getting rid of the compost in the ground creates healthier roots. But uh, light frequent irrigation, you can get by with less water than if you water deeply and infrequently. And get the same results. That's that's all the research that UC Davis did. That's just the tomatoes, right? Now. Oh, any crop. And hoses too. Yeah. They did it on. Yeah, they did it on. They've done it on grapes. They've done it on almond trees. Yeah. Light, frequent watering is what all the. The best thing would have been nature water, by infrequent watering. Well, again, most roots are in the top foot of soil, so if you water too deeply. The water can go further down than the roots can reach it, so you really don't want that to happen. Um, but yeah, plants just do better on a cons consistent water supply. Does it affect the leaves if the leaves get wet? The water? Or not? Okay. So most diseases uh, require the leaves stay to stay wet for four hours after the irrigation is over or the rain is over. So when it, when you're watering a leaf, the disease can't hold on, it gets washed off. So the disease has to actually land in a little droplet water. That water's gotta be able to sit there for at least four hours. And if it does that, like all, all spring long, we have the misty spring weather. So if you get your leaves wet in the morning, they might stay wet till noon. So it's better to water, say, mid-morning so that they can dry off before too long. Uh, or just don't get them wet at all, or, you, or else you have to keep watering. <laughs> you know, if you keep watering, they can't catch diseases. It's just that latent time between the, the water sitting there and evaporating off that causes diseases. <clears throat> you know, other than bugs transmitting diseases when they when they when they start from fungus. I mean, generally we don't have that much fungus on our tomatoes here like they do back east. Uh, early blight, which is the same disease that wiped out the potatoes in, uh, in Ireland, or was it late blight, are disease that when the water just sits on the leaf for long, long periods, or it's just misty weather for long periods of time. What about bottom watering where water is very up to the soil? Does that work? It does. The only thing you have to worry about, although tomatoes are real immune to this, would be if you water from below and you water upwards, and if you have salty tap water like we do, then the salts are brought to the surface. If you water from the surface down, you're pushing the salts down. It's, I don't think tomatoes really care that much. Uh, underground drip will work fine. Do tomatoes benefit from pine needles on the top then, if they like the acidity? Oh yeah. Well, most plants like it slightly acidic, so. And our tap water is like pH 10. Our soil is pH around seven or eight, seven and a half, eight. So yeah, everything would like it. Now it's not essential. If you use you know, organic fertilizers are not bothered by high pH, it's more the chemical fertilizers that are affected. As certain minerals dissolve at certain pHs. That's why, you know, if you use Miracle Grow, you need a slightly acidic uh, soil so that all those nutrients are available. If it's organic, um, the organic systems don't really care that much about pH. So. Now in pots, if you do use an artificial potting soil like ours, there is no bacteria and fungus in there yet, so uh, the organic fertilizers kind of start slowly, so you can, like when we start plants in our soil, we always add a little osmocose, because it works immediately. You can put the organics in there at the same time. The difference between this and this is about two minerals. This has, this is lacking two minerals that this has. This has got 10 or 11. This has got 12 or, well, this, there's 17 minerals in plants. 
So because organic fertilizers are dead plants and dead animals, all of them are in there that they need. Uh, the chemical ones they put most of the, well they put all the major ones, some of the micro, micronutrients they leave out, assuming that your soil or your whatever you're using has those. Like you said, you never have to add nickel, <coughs> nickels all over. Do you mix those into your soil or just on top like other fertilizers? The instructions are to mix them, we don't mix them because if we're doing more than one pot, We'll just forget, you know, okay, did we put osmocote yeah. in there, what to dig in there and see if we did? So we just throw it on top. When you water it, roughly it varies. So let's say you plant one of those little things, little tomato plants now, and you put it in the ground. So when you put it in, you just sprinkle a little bit of the food tree fertilizer, water a little bit, and sort of let it go. And then when would you fertilize it again? Let's you can watch your leaves. If it's growing fast and leaves are staying nice and green like this, you don't worry about it. If they start turning, we know a lack of nitrogen <coughs> on these, the, the veins start turning purple or, you know, that uh, bronze, your plant starts looking kind of bronzy. Uh, they won't lack phosphorus ever. Phosphorus turns them red, but we don't see that because the ground's full of phosphorus. But nitrogen, we notice if we don't feed them for about three months, they start turning bronzy or purple, and you fertilize them, they recover. Yes. Okay. I don't want to miss what you just said. It was about water, and I don't know if it covered everything. I mean, pH balance. Now, you said if it's if you're growing organic, you don't have to worry about the pH. Does that apply only to um, tomatoes or? Or is that just kind of the general? Right, and in, 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 uh, so in a survey that UC Davis did around the Central Valley, they wanted to see how the native plants react to the different soils. And they uh, said their conclusion was apparently the plants don't get anything out of the dirt because no matter what the pH was, no matter what the soil makeup was, sand clay, they said the same plants they were surveying grew in all the areas as long as they had a pile of dead leaves underneath them. They were apparently getting all the nutrients from the dead leaves directly and not through the soil. So in nature, and the way tomatoes work, that would apply. Um, a fungus brings, gets some of the nutrients from the surface, if it's organic, uh, and the pH doesn't really matter. So Now water-wise, um, the thing that actually counts is the fact that uh, most plant roots are in the top foot of soil. So your role, your job is to keep the top foot of soil moist. Again, tomatoes, not as critical as other plants because they've got stronger pull on water. They can pull water out of almost dry soil. But if you want them to grow at maximum rate, then you need to keep their entire root system moist, which is about a foot. If you have real sandy soil, a foot and a half. And the only way you can tell that is you get a, a stick like a size of a pencil See how far you can push it in the ground. If you can push it in a foot fairly easily by hand, it's wet a foot deep. If you can push it in two foot, you're wet two foot deep. And it doesn't matter if it's sand or clay, anything that's moist, you can push a stick through. That's moist enough for a plant to get, for any plant to get water out of. Again, tomatoes can get by on drier soil, so. The larger tomatoes are more apt to crack. The one problem with the larger size tomatoes is that the fruit often gets what is called um, blossom end rot. So blossom end rot mainly occurs on the bigger fruit and then a spot on the bottom of it, the very bottom blossom end of the fruit will just get hard and dark and make that fruit inedible. That is a lack of calcium in the fruit. And sometimes your soil has got plenty of calcium in it it's just that the tomato's so big, it doesn't make it into the fruit. It does, there's not enough, the plant is not able to get enough calcium into the fruit to finish it properly. Um, there are sprays we have with a picture of the tomato on it. It says blossom and rot, rot stop. You spray it on the fruit itself. You don't spray the plant, just spray the fruit and it'll get enough calcium in the fruit um, to finish it off. Now. They say as tomato plants get older, they get more efficient at getting 
calcium into the larger fruits. You can throw gypsum on the ground, that's calcium sulfate, to make sure that you have enough calcium. In fact, if you're growing lots of fruits and vegetables, it's nice to keep on adding calcium. Almost every fruit needs calcium in it to develop properly, apples, um, squash, peppers often suffer from the same malady, the hard spots in the foot. Now, oh, go ahead. So among the pests on tomatoes, early on you might get aphids and some of those potato psyllids. Keep an eye on them for them. They usually don't never get that bad. Usually the ladybugs, the lace wings, the surface flies, the good bugs come and eat them up and you don't have to worry about those. The first really nasty pest weed you get is around late June, early July. You gotta have 80 degree weather for a few weeks and then all the uh, tomato hornworm moths wake up, they emerge from the ground from their pupae, fly around in the dusk, right at dusk, and you'll see, you'll see things fly by that look like hummingbirds, and they'll just zoom down, lay eggs on your tomato plant, and then you get those giant green hornworms. Um, if you don't want to hand pick them <laughs> and, and cut them in half, uh, if you spray something like Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew, there's a lot of products that have a material called Spinosad. So we carry three different brands of Spinosad. Um, the ready to use ones, if you, sp now the Spinosad will last two weeks on your tomato plant. The caterpillars have a four week life, I used to raise them when I was a kid. So they have a four week life cycle. The first two weeks, they're too small to eat more than one leaf. By the third week, they're starting to eat the whole branch. So if you spray a spinoset on your plants once a month, you will not have any caterpillars older than two weeks and you won't see much damage. So that happens. I haven't seen them come out earlier than mid-June unless we have a real early heat wave. This year, everything's happening early, so we'll see. But uh, usually July is when you have to start spraying if you want to prevent the big green hornworms. Um, Would beam oil kill them also? Not very well. If, if they're small, it, it probably would, but you never see them when they're small. So by the time they're big, a lot of times by the time they're big, even the regular uh, pesticides uh, don't hurt them that much. Now there's another product called BT that is always promoted for killing hornworms. Um, bacteria thuringiensis, uh, it's a disease that you apply to your plants that kill hornworms, it kills any caterpillars. The disadvantage of that one, I mean the advantage of it, it is very specific to caterpillars only, which is good because if you spray this directly on a bee, you'll kill it. Once it dries, it won't hurt it. Uh, but if you spray it right on any bug, you can probably kill that bug. But again, once it dries, it, it kills primarily caterpillars, uh, green grasshoppers, beetles, anything that chews holes, pill bugs. Uh, doesn't kill uh, snails or slugs, uh, and it kills thrips, which is a new critter that's really causing trouble. So we spray a lot of this for thrips. But anyway, the BT only kills caterpillars, but it has a life on the plant of only about five or six hours. So you'd have to apply this at least every two weeks to kill, keep the big hormones off your plants. Um, I wanted to go just real quick back to the calcium. I thought it was a good idea, instead of saving my eggshells and throwing them out, to uh, blending my eggshells, putting them in water, letting them soak, and then spraying on my leaves. Bad idea. I don't know how readily calcium dissolves. Oh, okay. uh, I don't know. Uh, I, not my field. <laughs> I'll just water it. Because the calcium in the calcium sprays is some calcium something or other. It's an, it's ionic in there, I think. It's not eggshells. But eggshell, you know, it's always good to put eggshells out in the garden. Put the eggshells where? In, in your in garden. garden. I mean, it's nice to recycle everything. Like a hole or try to punch them up or? 
You crush them up, the, the snails and slugs will crawl over. Yeah, just throw them in a blender, make them powder, and throw them all over here. I mean, the role, the, the role or the ideal for all the farms in the future is don't throw anything away. You know, they throw a horde of material into the landfills right now. Um, in the tropics, what they're doing, especially the poorer farmers, they're burning it. Of course, you know, they won't let you burn a crop in Orange County because of the smoke. But what they do, which is, um, which is actually beneficial to their soil, what they do is they get the crop really hot and burning, and then they get a bulldozer and just cover it. And so that real hot fire, the burning plants, no more oxygen, they all turn to charcoal, which is what makes black soil rich in black. Charcoal is the material that makes that black soil, not rotting plants. Uh, if you can create charcoal, you, you enrich your soil. So. Are you saying so if you have a fireplace and you burn wood and then you save the charcoal? The charcoal is fine. Yeah, the ash it, it's got a lot of potassium, but it's highly alkaline. The charcoal is the charcoal is right. You can chop it up in little pieces, of course. Right, right. But they claim that charcoal is. Uh, charcoal content of the soil, this was an article in National Geographic a long time ago, they said one to two and a half percent charcoal on the ground makes the soil both rich and look black. They said it doesn't take much charcoal to make the ground look black. And they said it usually happens from a sudden volcanic eruption where, you know, that heat blast just incinerates the trees or a campfire or a very hot wildfire. Will this cause the trees to turn to charcoal? Yes. I'm so sorry for my question. So charcoal is not charcoal, right? Like charcoal, barbecue charcoal. The free cuts? Yeah. No. They well, should be, don't. but some have chemicals in them. <laughs> 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 it's it's natural. Natural. It's quite natural, right? Uh, so they have natural charcoal. Okay. I mean, you can. There is a form of charcoal that that's taken from the ground. It, or it acts like charcoal. They call it humic acids. I have on the back shelf. It's a charcoal deposit from Texas, and uh, well, a coal deposit, but it acts like charcoal. So John and Bob soil optimizer is, is the same product. The, um, the humic acid, same product. And if you buy grow power fertilizer, which is a popular fertilizer that we actually like, but we don't care it. Its main thing in there is, uh, is the charcoal from Texas. So it's black stuff. Okay, I think we covered most of this stuff. Now I'll go over some of the varieties. Hey, can I ask you a quick question mm -hmm. on which is part of the disease? Okay. Sure. Are some of my tomato plants have that white, is that blight? Oh, yeah. Well, mildews can certainly happen. So, in fact, that's a good. That's a good. Um, so, besides the spinosad products, which is heavily used on a lot of plants, we also like the horticultural oils, and the oils tend to be the ones that control disease, the mildew diseases, aphids, the smaller sucking bugs, white fly, spider mites are common on tomatoes too. So the oils, uh, there's neem seed oil, there's a, a mineral oil I have on the shelf. They all have the organic label. And then you have the, um, there's a whole bunch of these come in now. Dr. One line where they have the essential oils from your pantry. This one's rosemary, sesame, peppermint, thyme, cinnamon, and garlic oil all combined. In fact, the horticulture is real interested in these products now because there are some bugs that seem to be immune to neem, and some bugs seem to be immune to the mineral, but you combine six oils, and they don't seem to be able to survive it. So these are becoming the new thing. Um, I would tell you if you want, you know, if you want to keep your garden more bug free, then one week you do this, one week you do this, one week you do this, you kind of alternate. Both of these come in a form that attaches to the hose. 
briefly blast them. So that's less toxic. Now, I forgot to mention spinosad is an interesting product. It was found in a rum distillery in the Caribbean islands, hence the Captain Jack's label. So, um, um, so they consider organic in that it's made by bacteria and most people have already drank it. So they consider it, uh, so you can spray this on your tomato and eat it the next day. Um, it is a, a chemical that's highly used in veterinary medicine, so. Look, look at my dog's Lee tablet. You feed this tablet to your dog, it's spinosad. It's a lot stronger than what's in here. So it's safe for the dog to eat, and it kills all the fleas on the outside of their body. Like, wow, <laughs> that's intense. Yeah. Are they damaging to like tomato gnats and white flies? Well, gnats, uh, the common gnats, especially the ones you see flying indoors, they're called fungus gnats. Mm -hmm. So we don't know how much damage they do to plants. We know that they can certainly mess up the roots of seedlings, the real tender roots of seedlings. So in, in uh, propagation <coughs> greenhouses, they control the gnats. This will control them. Uh, because they start eating up all the little roots of your seedlings. If, but we think in nature they might be eating the fungus roots, but seedling roots are pretty tender too, so they might, they will eat those also. So it's not good to have the gnats around. Now white flies, they're sucking bugs and they can do a lot of damage. So the oils are good for that. Really? How would you do it to Spray it on. Anywhere. You can spray the soil and it'll kill, you know, pups, uh, sow bugs, pill bugs in, in the soil and things that we use. Okay, let's go over the variety. Now everyone has a list. Um, I'll just go over some of the more, I mean, there's so many new ones all the time and so many vague ones that. It's real hard to uh, describe all. I had a friend who used to sell the tomato. You know, you did the taste test. He'd do them all by heart. It's like he would list 200 tomatoes in his head and tell you about each one. Of course, after about 10, you'd totally forget what he just said because most of the descriptions were just the same. But, you know, he knew them through and through. But some of the important ones now, I didn't bring a sample of Big Boy in here, but Big Boy has the distinction of being the first one that Burpee created back in the 1940s. And it was the first tomato that was fairly easy for homeowners to grow. And they said it was a hybrid. Um, Burpees breeders would not tell anyone what, hybrid, what heirlooms they're using to create it. Uh, they said in the 70s, one of the breeders was about to die and he told them what they had in in the big boy to make it taste good and all that stuff. And he said that black crim <laughs> made their flavor. So black crim is an heirloom from Russia. Yeah. Uh, I brought one in here, but apparently I didn't. So black crim uh, has a smoky, salty flavor that a lot of the black tomatoes have. <clears throat> That, that was one of the flavor things for the big, big boy. So they created a lot of them. Better boy. Let me just pick these up a moment. So lemon boy, another one of the boy series. Uh, big yellow <coughs> tomatoes, fairly mild, but, but pretty good tasting. Most people tell you this is the most productive tomato they've ever seen. What is the name? Lemon boy on your list, so you can just check them off. Um, kind of a medium yellow, but boy, you, you plant this in your yard, you get like 50 to 100 tomatoes about that big. I mean, it, it is a very impressive producer of tomatoes. So ask almost anyone who grows tomatoes, they'll tell you Lum Boy is the best producer. Yeah. This is not a question about varieties, but I was always told, 
We talked about that, yeah. Keep that stem, just a single stem going single up. Single stem. Right. But yeah, because I mean, I have, I have plants that have multiple stems and right. they still keep growing those things. Out of there. Well, my, one of my wife grows tomato plants, she just lets it all grow and lean out of the cage. Yeah. But if you want to make your garden more efficient and start them off two feet apart and never let them branch, then that's the most efficient way to grow tomatoes. But if you want to just grow them huge, that's fine too. It works both ways, but it's more efficient not to let the side branches grow. Because you can, you can set the plants exactly to just what you want them to be apart so that they're maximum sunlight exposure. If you let them branch, that messes the, the sunlight exposure up. So. Okay, so Juliet, uh, notable because this was the original grape tomato. So they created it because for, for salads, cherry tomatoes, they squirt at you. So they can be pretty messy. So they cross cherry tomatoes with Roma tomatoes, which are the solid tomatoes, to get the grape tomatoes. So grape tomatoes became a super hit because they don't squirt. So Juliet was the original, all the other ones are kind of heirloom versions of Juliet. So. Now Sun Gold, uh, the most popular tomato in England because they have such cool weather. I didn't know this was from Japan. They, they, they make a lot of good tomatoes in Japan. Sun Gold is a Japanese hybrid. Um, very sweet, uh, small, orange tomatoes has one fault I mean it is a fault that it that it splits real easy when you uh, when you wash them okay now Jerry on that plant there you have two major stems so you would be or is that two separate plants there's like three growing in there okay but if that was like one you would pinch one of them off just so you have the one plant going up mm -hmm. okay if you want to do it that way early girl another one from the was from the boy series too an early girl um, can get by in cooler weather although we're already past the cooler weather uh, but it's got a medium size six ounce really tasty tomato we think it is related to our favorite tomatoes our best-selling tomatoes which are momotaro and momotaro gold because when you eat them you can you can see this this has a similar flavor to uh, early girl. So Momotaro, also known as poor boy, peach boy, excuse me, peach boy. Momotaro in Japanese is peach boy. Um, well, it's great in Japan, it's a hybrid. They have, if it's got the Japanese label on it, it is the hybrid. There are a lot of heirloom versions of this. We've noted that the heirlooms are not reliably as tasty. Sometimes they're as good, sometimes they're not. So whoever's making the heirloom seeds aren't being as picky. But uh, this has the sweetness and the flavor that a lot of people just love. So it's still our best sellers are expensive because Momotaro. M-O-M-O-T-A-R-O. -O -O -O. Peach boy. We have a, a company, a Seagroves, whose owner, I think it retired, it was Japanese, it was from Japan. They so brought a bunch of stuff from Japan over here. So they still have the Japanese label. The Momotaro came out first, which is kind of a pinky red. Momotaro Gold came out second. We don't know how the relationship is, if it just happened or what they did to create that. And now they're telling us that Ray Ika, R-E-I-K-A, is the new version of Momotaro. We haven't eaten this enough to tell you that it's better. But that is, has been our best-selling line of tomatoes, the early girl, but uh, Momotaro's.
Okay, one of the most, um, well, Big B, this came out in the 80s, no, ni late 90s, when that commercial was on the television about Big B. Anyway, um, Big B is, they said, one of the marvels of modern genetics. So this thing's resistant to just about any disease that you can think of, although not probably not the new ones. Uh, the fruit is so perfect it doesn't look real. Tastes good. So the fruit on this thing are perfectly round. I mean, you just don't see tomatoes that are look like red tennis balls. Perfectly round fruit. Um, really gorgeous fruit. Um, the plant is really strong. I, I had one plant grow four years in my yard. <laughs> Lived for four years. That was back before we had the bad diseases. Yeah. What was that called again, Gary? Big beef. It's not as interesting as, you know, Momo Charles flavor or some of the other ones, but certainly if you like <clears throat> just a good plain tomato, that, that's a, that one's a good one. <clears throat> now the original heirloom that made heirlooms famous was Brandywine. So Brandywine, um, doesn't make many fruit. I mean, it's a fairly poor producer, but it makes these huge fruits that taste like tomato soup. Real creamy flavor. So, Brandy Wine started the heirloom craze back in the 80s, but there's a lot of heirlooms out there now, and there's a lot of different Brandy Wines that supposedly are more productive than the original. Another early, fairly, early uh, heirloom is uh, green zebra, which is a striped green and kind of greenish yellowish tomato with kind of yellowish with green stripes on it. Uh, it gives you that spicy sweetness that a lot of striped tomatoes have. So this was one of the early striped ones, green zebra. It's a fairly small tomato, about so big. Three ounce for them. Now, Better Boy um, came out in the 60s, and it's still to this day the best selling tomato in the U.S. for homeowners. Uh, more and mostly in the Midwest, but it's a fairly large, it says here up to about one pound tomato. That's easy to grow and good flavor. Around here, you know, it's maybe our top 20, but in the central United States, it's number one. Champion was the best seller in the 80s, 70s, 80s. Mortgage Booster has an interesting story. The mortgage lifter is also known as Radiator Charlie. Um, a mechanic in Virginia created this. They said he got he got famous because he knew where to put his radiator shop right at the base of the hill that the coal trucks had to drive over where they always overheated. So they would kind of roll backwards to his radiator shop and he fixed them there. And he had enough spare time um, that he talked to the guys at the nearby universities how to breed tomatoes. And he actually created one. He got the uh, German Johnson, and that was a famous name he, he put. And he put them all in a big circle so they would cross with each other. And he took the babies from those and created uh, a real famous tomato back in the 1940s and 50s. And he called mortgage lister because he said from the proceeds he was able to buy himself a house. <laughs> he was selling for, I think they said two dollars each, which in the 40s was a fortune. Because it had such a great reputation in those days. So that's mortgage lifter. <laughs> There's Roma, so that's the original paste tomato. We also have San Marzano. Uh, which is a Roma type from San Marzano. 
from the city of San Marzano. And here's San Diego. Now San Diego is for the coast, so there are a lot of farms near the coastline of San Diego and they suffer from that morning mist that really messes up people right on the coast. So this tomato was created uh, to solve that problem. So it's, it handles apparently the blights that, uh, that plague growing near misty weather. Most of the real notable ones. Let me just go through these real fast. Can I ask you a question on the sweet 100 to the sweet million? Mm -hmm. Is the sweet million just more prolific or is it just the name? Don't know. I haven't. <laughs> I grew sweet 100. That was the first tomato plant I grew when I was a kid. And I haven't grown sweet million. So I don't know. I mean, most of them are, are supposed to be getting sweeter. But sweet 100 was just fine. Sweet enough. Um, Here, um, I, uh, I I wanted to try to get these brown tomatoes that I've seen in Sprouts. You know, they're like they look brown. And then I was at Tomato Mini like two weeks ago, and I like bought some chocolate ones. And I'm not I'm trying to get the ones that they said that they were from Mexico. The ones from Sprouts. Are there any brown tomatoes? I looked at all the colored ones. I mean, I don't know. If I'm, <coughs> I'm sure there are now. Black and brown tomatoes, the way they're created is that they've got, it's actually the flesh inside that's making that color. Because they said on the black tomatoes, the flesh inside is actually green. And with the combination of the skin, it's making them look brownish or blackish. So. Now, tomato mania is kind of interesting. My aunt had a nursery in Pasadena called Hortz. And they had people employed there. Uh, well, when her, when her husband died, they let Gary Jones run the place. And he created the Hortus Nursery. And they sent out flyers to every house in Southern California. His, acre, his nursery was about this big. And I couldn't believe the expense that they were, you know, to have a mailer with maybe 500 tomatoes listed on it going to every house. I got one in, when I lived in Mission Hill, I got a flyer. Like, they, they went out of business uh, in five years and they turned out to be, uh, well, they were in death. But um, yeah, that, that was an uh, incredible feat that they did with, and that became tomato mania. Uh, I can't remember his name, Di, Scott B, Scott, Di, I've talked to him a few times, uh, but they now go from store to store or from area to area with this all, you know, 400, 500 varieties of tomatoes, but my on store was the start of that in Pasadena, <laughs> so uh, crazy. Gary, I have a question for you. When you plant, let's say I have a tomato in a container like this, I want to put it in the ground. Do you routinely take off your bottom several leaves so that they also will grow roots when you put them in the ground? That's interesting. Yeah, so Sunset Magazine about 20 years ago ran an article saying that they plant tomatoes any which way they can to see which one actually made them grow better. So, you know, they, so they planted some deep, they planted, they, they scored root ball on some. They did all kinds of things. They said the only thing that really made a difference to the plant was to fillet the root ball and spread it out like a butterfly. They said that sped it up. Now, you can reason behind that. You say, okay, most of the potting soils aren't very good and not very, they don't have good oxygen because they're all compost. So if you fillet it and spread it out to the sides, it gets more, the roots have more access to oxygen. It's almost like you're bare rooting them. So they said that was the only one that made a difference. So they don't recommend you know, doing this, scoring the root ball or planting them deeper. They said play the root ball or you know you can make holes in it to get the air in there. That seemed to make them grow faster. Like I know my dad, I mean, he was in his 90s and stuff. And, and we used to plant them because the ground was so hard. 
he would actually take them and lay them so the roots would be on the side and then just the true leaves would be above the ground but he would pull the bottomers up and when you do pull them up i mean they there root. are roots oh yeah they root right in yeah but yeah you get them closer to the surface that way yeah. by yeah. moving sideways yeah. so that yeah so it's a lot to do with air air to the roots mm -hmm. any other questions there are a lot of um, different seed companies. So if you were planning to grow the tomato by seed, is there one company that you would recommend, a seed company that is pretty dependable and you know, they're really. all pretty much the same? Yeah, the, the seed company, most of them aren't the seed growers. Anymore. It's like, it's interesting. The people who run this company, Botanical Interest, mm -hmm. their owner interned at this company. <laughs> so, Kitazawa uh, is a seed company that was in the Bay Area of San Francisco over 100 years ago. And they were specialized in bringing seeds from Asia to California for the farmers to plant. But they were the first ones who started doing this kind of stuff, putting them in envelopes, uh, grading the seeds out. So this company learned from this company how to do that. Uh, so Kitazawa has been around a long time. But, you know, they all buy their seeds in from other growers that grow the plants. So, like this company says that they're having trouble keeping up with stock because of the pandemic. You know, they were, two years ago they had estimated a 70% increase in sales, but it was actually double that, they said. So they're selling seeds now that are intent, they were intending to sell next year. And so there were a lot of the racks are empty because they're just getting seeds in for this year that they have to test first to make sure they sprout. Uh, but not every, you know, so the problem is, you know, every batch of seeds you buy from them may be different from a different seed company, seed grower, so it's hard. Question on the seeds. You said that they had so many seeds that they would sell then and then the rest the following year. But on the seed packet, it always has... A big bite. Yeah. Yeah, so the, what they do see is they have to run a test and see how many seeds sprout. So that test is good for one year. So every year they, they can have the same batch of seeds for on some plants like peas for the last century, or not some decades. So they can take that same batch of seeds and test every year, find the germination rate and get that okayed by US Department of Agriculture or whatever and use that and say plant it because our test is good for one year. So they have to retest the seeds, but they can use the same seeds over and over. So the seeds could last longer than... Oh yeah. Yeah, most tomato seeds, you go five years later, they still sprout. Some seeds don't, but, you know, um, we have two options. We can get a smaller crop on our seeds and send the seeds back to them, or we can take a bigger crop on seeds and then keep the leftovers for us um, to do with the old several ways that seed companies handle this. Yes. So when you're trying to save tomato, tomato seeds for yourself, um, how do you, you get them out of the, the tomato and then do you, do you freeze them? I've heard some seeds have to be frozen like blueberries or something before they sprout. Yeah. Or, you know, do, you, or do you have to do anything to tomato seeds? You just dry it, dry it on a paper <coughs> towel or whatever and that's it? Okay. I do them on parchment paper towel they get stuck in. Oh, yeah. good plan. Well, I'll write that down. Yeah, some people will ferment them in a jar of water for a week so that the slime just separates from the seeds easier. Um, yeah, some seeds are that are from plants in temperate climates have to be exposed to cold before they'll sprout. Tomatoes are from the equator, so they don't you know, they'll just sprout when the temperature is right. But uh, blueberries, being temperate, they have to be chilled. When did the growers start their seeds to get plants to size. So this is probably about two months. Okay. Yeah, a month and a half. Okay. This is probably two months ago. I mean, they, they really take off once they get a certain size. Um, do you recommend pruning tomatoes? Well, you can. You just set them, set them back. And are they as prolific or do Well, any growth that they make will have flowers on it. 
So when you talked about the one stamp, you just pull it up over size, and everything will just come out of that one stamp. Right. Okay. So it's continuing making flowers as long as the temperature is right. Do you ever top your plant? Like if this gentleman here had it growing in the bucket with that long pole, do you ever like tip the top like, you know? He didn't, he just had this long enough stem, he'd get enough crop off it, but you know, he, he had a pole, he had so many, he didn't really care. Okay. Um, I don't know, it's, sometimes it's better to start a new plant. <laughs> so. Why are growth pattern, like there's more varieties of the growth pattern being indeterminate versus determinate. Why is that? Don't know. I don't know the genetics, but the genetics is different. I mean, you can say a pepper plant, any pepper plant is an, a determinate grower. It's on pepper plants, the whole plant blooms at the same time and all the fruit ripens at the same time and it won't make any more fruit until you pick that fruit off and then it starts growing and flowering again. So that's determinant. That's how determinant tomatoes would work too. Uh, the indeterminants are what most hot houses would want. They want to be able to pick constantly, not all at once. Uh, but determinants what the paste people want. I don't know if our let me check the Roma and see if it says if it's determinant or not. <coughs> Okay. Yeah. So yeah, paste tomatoes. They want them. They want to pick them all at once. Right. I see that one of the determinants, right, the celebrity, mm -hmm. um, excellent flavor, right. Mm -hmm. And so, like, that's the only one. And so I'm just looking for all the excellent flavors. But that um, mortgage lifter, a gentleman that I was walking with, you know, was telling me all about that. He saved his house with his tomatoes. I was like, we could save our homes with our tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think that would be in today's dollars per plant? Four dollars in the 1940s? Oh wow. That's got to be not 20, 30 at all or more. Question about the pot indeterminate soil. If I have an I mean, hothouse tomatoes are grown in a true fiber. This is like a 3.8. So a lot of hothouse tomatoes are grown in what we call the Dutch bucket, which is a bucket about this dimension, but square, so it's bigger. It actually holds five gallons. But I've grown, you know, just for tasting, I've grown a lot of tomatoes in this size. Because you'll get about 10 to 20 tomatoes in this size. And then the plant juice is just too big for this pot after a while. But uh, that's a... 3.8 gallon, of course you got the 7 gallon and the 15 gallon, which aren't really at that size either. So would you fill it with the acid mixed potting soil? Mm -hmm. So if you have a very spread, which I do, and I grew some tomatoes last year, and I have had a lot of uh, compost and topsoil mixed in, and now I want to get ready to pet all these tomatoes I'm going to get, should I add the acid mix part of soil, or should I? Because it's very humus. It's very, and it seems to only when I water, I have a few things in it already, that the top layer gets wet when I water. But the bottom, unless I really stir it up, <coughs> it doesn't get seeming wet. Mm -hmm. Should I add something possibly like the potting soil, or should I add other things that I can, let's say, buy? No, you don't have to add anything. I mean, it's very humus, it's very loose. Right, so. But dry. Yeah, well, it's the in initial. It's very hot sun all day. Right, so when you first plant a crop, the initial watering is the key. Uh, like, the water next, before you plant. Oh, after. Well, it doesn't matter either what before or after, but when we, we used to list the land in the middle of a organic farm, and they watered their crops with here, you know, with drip irrigation, but every time they planted a crop, you know, the field was so dry. Every time they planted the crop, they would roll out their sprinklers that would just be on for like four hours. And soak it good. Yeah, soak everything good, because that ground gets so dry between crops. 
And then they would just use the drip system underneath the plastic after that. But that initial watering, they just really soaked it. So that was, you know. So one should, uh, so I should probably add anything other than fertilizer maybe when I plant the tomatoes? Well, you don't need much, they don't, again, they don't need much fertilizer. If their ground's been there a long time. Well, just about a year. Yeah. And I started out with a lot of compost and topsoil. I added a big bag of topsoil just recently to get ready. Yeah, so you, sh that, you may not have to add anything. Just put it in there. Yeah, and, just fertilize it, each yeah. plant. That, like you mentioned, the fruit stuff. But if I were going to use a big pot like this, I would just dump that in there. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. As it makes That's it pottage. Like and would yeah, you add any additional sand? Last year it was just like to dump the acid mix, and then your tomato plants were huge. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the the just, mix. just the acid mix in the just thing. Came, yeah, she yeah. didn't do anything to it, and it, you know, it was just, yeah. I'm tempted to try that. So, Gary, is that acid mix loose enough to the tomato plant once it's done and then to repot the next year? No. No. It's too heavy, so, you, so you'll have to use it for something else. Mm -hmm. At our house, we don't throw our soil away ever. We always use it for something else. Mm -hmm. just it's hard because all the plants that I like are all in the same family. <laughs> so eggplant and peppers and tomatoes. And Right, if you want to grow tomatoes year after year, then you have to rotate your soil. You have to rotate, okay, yeah. Either rotate the crop or rotate the soil. Mm -hmm. But so. if we had it for a couple of years and we're saying, we're saying, okay, I want to get something new. Do you ever grow peppers under your tomatoes? Uh, my daughter does. She grows everything in the same pot in my house. She used to live with us and she'd have strawberries <coughs> and tomatoes and everything grows in the same pot. So the best uh, plant to plant, let's say, we, when we had a big bed and let's say we do quite a few tomatoes, which would be the best plant to plant with it, like, to fill in the spot in the beginning? Is there such a thing? Well, again, if you want, want to plant your garden properly, you, don't, you, want, you want to rotate your crop properly, right. then generally you don't want to plant too much else besides oh, no the tomatoes. peppers or... Well, pep, well, that's... Okay, so we mentioned at the start, yeah. yeah, plants in the same family, peppers, tomatoes, eggplant, tomatillos, all in the same area is fine. Yeah, but so you I can like, put flowers in there if you want to fill in the gaps. I always, yeah. <laughs> I had like all my, le my, my lettuces, my spinach, and my celery. Now if I want to use that soil and rotate it, I would have to add some acid, though, if I was going to plant acid, tomato, acid plant. Like if I were taking that soil and put it in it to make it tomatoes, I would have to add some acid to it. Is that yeah. just use the same soil? Oh, yeah. that's easier. Okay. Just more fertilizer. Okay. Gary, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to ask, want to ask this one question. Uh, it's not related to tomatoes, but I noticed today you have made a post about Astromaria. It works. I would probably use the top pot because the acid mix is not as permanent as so the soil. So the top pot. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, it doesn't like too much heat. So morning, sun, afternoon shade is the best. Or between houses works pretty well too. Right. Into the dirt. This is all the are pretty easy going. It all is it? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is. Okay.